Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If I could have your attention, please. Good afternoon. We're so glad to have you here with us today. If you'll know, we are going to start a few minutes early. We want to accommodate uh, Senator Isaacson's schedule, so we are starting a few minutes early. We appreciate everyone being here early and enjoying lunch, so we'll go ahead and move the program along this, this afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Douglas County Greystone Power Luncheon. Today we're sponsored by Waste Industries, and we're so glad you're here with us. I'm Mike Stevens with Metro Bank, and I serve as the chairman of your Chamber of Commerce. And I'm glad to be here with you hosting today. Uh, before we give thanks for lunch, I'd like to uh, ha have everybody say thank you to Carabas for lunch and thank you to the, to the uh, diplomats for getting drinks out to us so we can give them a round of applause right quick. We appreciate your help. All right. If, uh, is Max Kaler here with us today? He's alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, was, I would like. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and do introductions here and keep the program moving along. I tell you what, uh, if we'll go ahead and bow our heads, we'll ask grace and then stand to say the Pledge of Allegiance. If you'll bow your head and join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today for gathering together as a free country. We thank you for uh, allowing us all to come here together and fellowship and socialize. We appreciate all the freedoms we have in this country and the, and the chance to gather together. We thank you for everyone who joined us here today. Help them go forward and, and keep your will in mind. Those things we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. You'll stand with me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Be seated. Thank you. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Johnny Isaacson is a businessman, a public servant, a family man, and, a, and with his common sense approach to leadership and conservative values, he's uh, stood out as a leader in Georgia and in the U.S. over the past 30 years. He's been a business leader. Johnny served as president of Northside Realty for over 20 years. During his tenure in leadership, that company grew to be one of the largest independent real estate brokerage firms in the Southeast. Uh, in politics, Johnny has served in both the Georgia House and Georgia Senate. He served as chairman of the Georgia Board of Education, and he was elected three times to the U.S. House before winning his U.S. Senate seat in 2004. He's up for re-election for that Senate seat this November. Uh, Johnny and his wife Diane have been married since 1968, and he has three grown children and nine very proud grandchildren. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you jo Senator Johnny Isaacson. Well, thank you uh, very much. It's an honor to be in Douglas County and Douglasville, and I apologize in advance that my schedule has changed a little bit of your schedule, and I have to do another dedication in a few minutes. So after my speech, I'll be running out. And it's not because I'm mad at anybody. <laughs> it's just because that I do have to get to another event. But it's great to be in Douglasville. You know, I have a, a special place in my heart for Douglas County. We had a great real estate office here for years in Thornton Road where we did a lot of business in the community. I met a lot of you that are here today. I really have the privilege of extending my connections to Douglas County because Tyler Thompson, where's Tyler? Just raise your hand. Tyler's on my staff, and he's Cindy Lyle's son. Where's Cindy? So I got Cindy Lyle connections to Douglas County, and it's all the way in Washington in my office, and I'm glad to have both of them here today, and it's so good to see so many friends. And having been a former chamber chairman and the former president of a real estate business that ran a company during four recessions, I want to talk a little bit about the economy. Uh, because I know everybody's having difficult times. We're in a protracted recession. Uh, I tell everybody, everybody says, what's your opinion? I say, well, here's my opinion. This is straight shooting now. My opinion is that we're in the most difficult recession this country's ever seen, that it's been a three-year recession, which is bumping along at the bottom in a trough. We're going to recover. America always has, but it's going to take us a long time to get back to where we were, probably five to seven years. And everybody says, well, what's going to make things make the difference? What's going to turn us around? And I said, what's going to turn us around is when the United States government understands 
that business doesn't risk capital and spend money if they don't know what their taxes are and they don't know what their regulations are. And so I, the one thing that I really enjoy doing in the United States Senate is using the lessons I learned in business to try and articulate on the floor of the Senate the flawed direction some of the course this country's been taking the last couple of years. Not to mention, first and foremost, the financial re-regulation bill which just passed the United States Senate before we broke in August. Now, we needed to find the answers to what caused the overall collapse of the economy beginning in 2007 and cresting in March of 2009. In fact, in a bipartisan effort, Kent Conrad, of a Democrat from North Dakota, and I passed what's known as the Financial Crisis Commission, which was appointed and is now meeting with subpoena powers. They brought them all in, Fannie, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, Moody, Standard & Poor, investment bankers, all to testify as to what the components parts that went wrong so we can, just like we did in the 9-11 Commission, we can figure out what we need to do to make sure what happened never happens again. But that commission's not supposed to report back until December 31st. But for political reasons, Harry Reid and a number of people in the Senate decide we ought to go ahead and do the re-regulation bill now even before we have the information. And so a bill that was a patchwork of regulation was passed, allegedly to attack Wall Street, but instead it attacked Main Street. In fact, to give you the clear, crystal clear example of that, every community bank, every banker in Georgia, as they go through this bill, is going to find a higher level of regulation, more accountability, more overhead for compliance officers, and more scrutiny on the bank. But Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, the root causes of the recession, are exempt from scrutiny. Now you tell me what makes sense to exempt what you know were the beginning of the end of the dominoes that caused the collapse, Freddie and Fannie, while having, having more layers on top of community banking and general banking in America. We now also have a new position called a financial regulation czar, who's going to be appointed by the president and not even accountable to a board of directors, which is another unilateral step of the executive branch to take the place of the legislative branch in terms of deciding the accountability in our process. So first and foremost, the regulation has been too rampant and too fast, and that's one of the reasons that American businesses are holding on to their capital. There are trillions of dollars on the sidelines right now because they don't know what their regulation is going to be and they don't know what their tax rate is going to be. And to that end, I'll get to the punchline of the speech early rather than wait till the end. One thing we can do in September when we go back is at least give business predictability on what their taxes are going to be. Right now, taxes go up for all Americans on December 31st. Every single American. Capital gains goes up, dividends goes up, income marginal rates go up, all of them. That's in addition to the 3.8% increase for those making over 250000 that came in under the health care bill. We need to make sure that those things don't happen and we extend the existing tax levels at least for three to five years to give a predictable cost rate in terms of taxes to business. Historically in America, every time we have lowered the rate of taxation, we have raised the revenue of the government. Because as you lower taxation, you raise opportunity, business does business, they make more money and they pay more taxes. Every time capital gains was reduced, first from 28 to 20, and then from 20 to 15, in the immediate year following those reductions, tax income went up, not down, from, uh, from capital gains. Why? Because people took mature assets, sold them so they could pay the lower tax rate, and then reinvested that money in a fledging new business that down the line would give a capital gains again. So it's essential, in my judgment, that you not raise taxes on the American people at a time in which they're in a deep and protracted recession. Secondly, you need to understand that small business is not America's rich. Small business is America's lifeline. Too many politicians talk about raising the top two marginal rates because that's the rich Americans. Most of the people in the top two marginal tax rates are people that own or run small businesses. Small businesses pay their taxes like individuals, not like corporations, because most are organized for the money to flow through as income on an individual earned income basis. So when you raise these two rates, you're raising them on small business. You're raising them on the one person you need right now to help bring back employment in America. It's not General Motors and IBM that employs most of America. It's Main Street, and it's small business. 65 to 75% of the employment state by state in America is provided by small business, 
not by big business. And when you cut the heart and soul out of small business, then you cut the heart and soul out of growth and employment. There are 8 million Americans unemployed, and a substantial number of those people are unemployed not because they got laid off at a big business, but because small business had to contract. If we can make sure small business knows where their tax rates are going to be, and they know what their regulatory environment is going to be, and there's some predictability, you'll see a recovery and a resurgence of our economy. And we may beat my prediction of five to seven years in terms of coming back, but we won't beat it, we won't even meet it, if we don't empower small business. Now, there are a lot of issues on the table in Washington, D.C. right now. And people all ask me what's going to happen when you go back in September. A lot of people are afraid of what might happen in the last minute or might happen in a later lame duck session. Quite frankly, I think the American people are so concerned and American politicians are getting the message when they're out there in the hinterlands talking to the people that I think you'll see Congress pass a continuing resolution of the existing appropriations and put it off into next year rather than try and do a last minute omnibus budget. And quite frankly, that's better for the American people because an omnibus budget is a great big 12 unit appropriations act, $3.6 trillion that rolls out one day without your chance to read it, see it, scrutinize it, or hold it accountable. And that's the wrong way to do business. Unfortunately, that half started under President Bush in his last couple of years, and it's contended under President Obama, and I vote against it on either occasion. I've been an equal opportunity opponent to omnibus budgets because it's just not the right way to run the railroad. But I do have a proposal to change the way America spends its money. I think America as a country needs to spend it like its money like Americans sitting around the kitchen table do. Now, I don't know about you, but in the last three years in this recession, I've sat down with my wife around the kitchen table and we've reprioritized where we're going to spend our money. We cut out some of those things that we couldn't see being able to afford anymore to prioritize those things we knew that were important. And there's probably not a business or a person in this room that hadn't done the same thing. Because none of us have the benefit of printing the money that pays our income. The only person that does is the United States government. And any time you have that temptation, you have problems unless you have a disciplined system of appropriating your money. So I introduced two years ago the Biennial Budget and Appropriations Act of Congress, which is going to be the main theme of my re-election campaign this year and the effort I'm going to make next year to change the way America does business. I think instead of appropriating every year on an annual basis and then running home and campaigning on what you spent to bring home the dollars to America, your community, instead you ought to appropriate in odd-numbered years and do oversight in even-numbered years. Think about this for a second. If in every odd-numbered year you passed a two-year Appropriations Act, so that in every even-numbered year, an election year, your job was oversight of expenditures, not appropriation of money, all of a sudden the, the paradigm would change. Instead of coming home to talk about the break-in you were going to bring home, you'd come home to talk about the savings that you found in a government that's bloated, has redundancy in its spending, and needs to get its fiscal house in order. It's something I hope very much we can do because it's what Americans do. It puts you living within your means. It puts you looking back at what you spent money on in the past to make sure in the future it's still a part of what you need to be doing. We need some good old-fashioned kitchen table type common sense approach to the spending of the American people's money. And there is a primary reason for that. The primary reason is we owe $13 trillion. And we're on a track that will take us to a deficit or debt of $19 trillion by the end of this president's second term, if he has a second term, or by the end of the next six years, whatever happens. Nineteen trillion dollars is unsustainable. There's only one way this country pays off nineteen trillion dollars, and that is to inflate the value of dollars so less pays off more. And when you do that, two things happen. Inflation runs rampant, and the value of your hard assets go down. That's not right for our children. It's not right for our grandchildren. It's not right for all those that fought to make this country so great. So we have got to draw the line, and the line doesn't need to be in the stand, in the sand. It needs to be in concrete. We're going to start spending within our means. We're going to start holding ourselves accountable. And we'll start budgeting and spending our money like the American people do, sitting around the kitchen table setting their priorities. Now, lastly, for a minute, and I'll take a question or two I want to talk about, I just don't think you should be in a position to send the sons and daughters of Americans to, to battle in Afghanistan or Iraq and not for a minute uh, address that subject. Because I've had the occasion to vote on both those commitments and I understand the importance of it and the gravity of it. 
First of all, we're very fortunate. David Petraeus wrote a, a, a road map for success in terms of the surge in Iraq, and it has succeeded. And if you watch last night's news, the second striker division is the last combat division is crossing the line out of Iraq into Kuwait. There are still 50,000 troops that will remain in Iraq for about a year to 15 months, only in an advisory and a security capacity. Iraq's security is totally under Iraqi command now. A country that nine years ago had an, a terrible despot who was killing people with chemical weapons and slaughtering people in mass graves. He's gone. That government, which was a dictatorship, is now a fledging democracy in a very dangerous part of the world. They've written a constitution. They've held four elections. They now are defending themselves, and they call their renaissance the awakening. They've awakened from centuries of tribal fights to where they're finding common ground between people of difference. We, did, Our young men and women who won that war brought that to about deserve a great deal of credit, as do the commitment of the American people to support them. And we've got to finish the job in Afghanistan. I was very sorry that David McChrystal's incident came up, but when you have a chain of command and there's a break in it, you do have to make a correction, and I understand that. We were just blessed that David Petraeus was willing to say yes one more time. If any of you had the chance to see his interview on Meet the Press last Sunday, it would have made you proud that that man is leading our troops. And I am convinced, just as he did in Iraq, he will come up with a road map that will lead us to victory. And we have to remember when we went into Iraq, we defined victory. Victory was letting the people write, write a constitution, hold their own free elections, and become capable of defending themselves. And that's all taken place. The definition of victory in Afghanistan is a little bit different because the countries are a whole lot different. But the victory in Afghanistan comes when you remove a safe haven for terrorism to operate freely and without abandon to threaten the future of the citizens of the United States of America. And that means the Taliban is dismantled and the safe haven is destroyed. It's a tough territory, it's a hard job, but America can do it. We have the finest soldiers and the finest committed citizens and an all-volunteer military of any country on the face of this earth. So with your prayers and our support, we'll come home with a victory there just as we have in Iraq, and this country will have done what it always did. It will have sent its sons and daughters around the world to liberate people and give them the chance to have freedom and never ask for a dime except for a couple of acres to bury their dead who sacrificed so that others could be free. That's why this is the greatest country on the face of this earth. God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. I think I can, I've got time about to take one good question. And that looks like one good question. <laughs> I'd be happy to. I, uh, you're just into a man that's a second-generation American. My grandfather immigrated from Oosterson, Sweden in 1903. He was the stonemason on Oglethorpe University in Atlanta, and he got a, became a citizen in 1926. That's why I'm a citizen today. I honor legal immigration, but I abhor a country that is not willing to secure its borders to ensure that illegal immigration doesn't become the way to come to America. The first speech I made on the floor of the Senate when I got elected was on the immigration issue because I had traveled Georgia for two years and I know the biggest concern were the number of perceived illegal and actual illegal people who were in the school systems, who were in the emergency rooms, and who were in the jails of the civil justice system. People in America were fed up, people in Georgia were fed up. And the problem today is worse rather than better. There was some commitment to secure the border, but it's been backed off from by both of the last two administrations. We've just got to see to it that the border between the United States and Mexico is secure where the way you enter America is the right way and the legal way. And there are a lot of reasons just beyond the moral issue. Right now, Atlanta, and I don't know if we got a sheriff in here or a deputy, but they will tell you that Atlanta is ground zero for drugs coming out of Mexico and Central America to this city to be redistributed up and down the East Coast. Most of the illegals coming across the border now aren't seeking work as much as they're working for a drug cartel that's trying to get methamphetamine or cocaine to Atlanta, Georgia, so it can be resold, redistributed, and fund those enter enterprises. That is why Arizonans have lost their lives on their ranches on the border near Fort Huachuca and Yuma, Arizona. It's why there are bullet holes in buildings in El Paso right on America's border 
because there's a drug war and there's not enough security on our side to keep that from coming across. So I am all for immigration reform, but I am first for securing the border. You can't reform anything as long as there's an easier way to do what the reform would bring about. And a border that leaks is a border that doesn't bring in good folks with what good intentions. So my predicate is I'll reform all the immigration you want to right after there's a secure border with Mexico so we can control the immigration that comes into the United States of America. You've all been very gracious. I'm sorry I can't stay for the rest of the program. I got one more speech I got to make before I catch a plane to New Hampshire. But thank you very much for having me. God bless you and God bless our great country. Thank you so much, Senator Isaacson, for those words. We appreciate your time here with us today, and we respect you have other commitments to attend to. So thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, Don is with Waste Industries and our host today. I'm going to ask him to step forward and say a few words about his company, if he would, please. Thanks, sir. All right. So uh, my name is Don Collins, and I am the government contract manager for Waste Industries. But I'm also married to Mimi from Mimi's Perfect Presence, our newest uh, chamber member. <clears throat> now, I've always been fascinated with marketing and advertising, especially the sneaky kind that you see on television and in movies, like when a guy wins the Super Bowl and they interview him at the end and they ask him what he's going to do next and he says, I'm going to Disney World. Or you watch a movie that has nothing to do with fast food and uh, by the end, you've heard him mention Taco Bell about 27 times. Well, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I negotiated with Mimi this morning. And though I'm going to tell you about Waste Industries here in the next few minutes, uh, every time I mention Mimi's perfect presence, I'm going to be handsomely rewarded. <laughs> so <clears throat> it's a very exciting year for Waste Industries. Uh, because we've been picking up garbage for 40 years. Uh, the two guys that started the business 40 years ago are still uh, running the company today. So it's, uh, it's a year of celebration as we celebrate our 40th anniversary. Now when I think about garbage, I think of Waste Industries. And I hope you do too. And when I think about celebrations, I think about Mimi's perfect presence. <laughs> Birthdays, weddings, <laughs> job promotions. That's two, right? Okay. Well, let's see here. Yep, and, and, and I hope you do too. Um, all, all of us at Waste Industries are very proud of our operations here in Georgia. We manage uh, 60 different city and county contracts, uh, and we uh, provide curbside residential garbage collection every week for over 350,000 homes uh, around the state. We're especially proud of uh, the Douglas service area, Douglas County service area. This is where our headquarters are located, our division headquarters. Uh, and uh, we also have a fantastic partnership with the city of Douglasville. Uh, we take all of their garbage to our landfill uh, over in Rockmart, Georgia. And uh, as part of that, we also provide all of the, the small dumpster services you'll see inside the city limits all the businesses behind uh, their, their business. You'll see the small dumpsters, many wonderful businesses, small businesses like Mimi's Perfect Presence. <laughs> and uh, in addition to that, we also provide uh, residential garbage service to thousands of residents in the unincorporated areas of the county. Um, we appreciate very much the opportunity to sponsor the luncheon today. Uh, uh, this and, and many other great events that the Chamber holds from the uh, annual banquet to the uh, business to community expo held at Arbor Mall. That's a, that's a great event. And we're very excited about the upcoming golf tournament on September 1st uh, at the Mirror Lake Country Club in lovely Villa Rica, Georgia, uh, who also has a contract with Waste Industries but does not have a Mimi's Perfect Presence <laughs> yet. I think that's five, baby. 
<laughs> All right. Uh, so we we really do love being part of the community. We love your garbage, and uh, we just we hope if you ever have the opportunity to to make a decision or a choice about who picks up your garbage, we hope you'll pick us, Waste Industries. Thank you. Don, all you needed was a flash and tie to add to that. <laughs> Thank you so much. We appreciate your support. Um, I want to take a few minutes to share some announcements with you, and then we'll do door prizes. Uh, taking, segueing on what Don said, we do have our upcoming Chamber uh, Golf and Tennis Classic on September 1st. We're very proud to say all our sponsorships have been sold out, but we'd love to have you come out and join us if you'd like to to play golf or play tennis, please pick up a sign-in sheet at the front desk. We'd love to have you come join us. Uh, if you are selling raffle tickets, would you raise your hand? We have folks selling $10 raffle tickets for the chance to win, right back in the back of the room and here, a chance to win $1,000 in local restaurant gift cards. So if you eat out for breakfast, lunch, and or dinner, please see one of these folks and buy a chance to win $1,000 in gift cards. Uh, we also want to remind you, right after lunch, we have a ribbon cutting out front for Cruise One. They're also one of our newest chamber members. It'll be in the foyer. Please join Kathy and Lon Brooks as they cut the ribbon on their new business. Um, a couple of priorities you get to have as chairman. I've got two organizations I'm involved with that I want to make mention. We've got events coming up. The annual Boys and Girls Club Spaghetti Sports Auction is coming up Saturday, the 21st, this Saturday at First United Methodist Church. Doors open at 6.30. Tickets are $10. See me or one of the other board members in the room if you'd like tickets to that. It's going to be a great event, a lot of fun. George Power and Greystone Power will see who is smarter than a fifth grader among the power companies. <laughs> so it should be a lot of fun. If you've got kids school age, bring them. They had a great, they had a great time, so it is a lot of fun. And it, all the proceeds do go to the Boys and Girls Club, which I sit on the board of. Also, United Way has their kickoff breakfast Wednesday, August 25th at Greystone Power. We appreciate Greystone's support. That will be at 730 in the morning to kick off our annual campaign. So uh, if you would like to find out more information about that, Patty Puckett's in the back of the room. She's the chair of the board of United Way this year. She can share information with you about that. Also, when Doc Padgett grabs your ear, you usually listen and you better do what she says. <laughs> Doc Padgett said that they are filming in her front yard. There's a, there's a film being made and it's in her front yard. It's being uh, orchestrated by the Douglas County Film Commission. So come on by and take a look at what's going on. So we appreciate that. Okay. Uh, also, I want to take a chance to thank the city of Douglasville for the use of the center. I want to thank uh, Carabas Restaurant for the food, Waste Industries uh, for today's sponsorship, and Greystone Power for the naming opportunity. Don, will you come back up? And we're going to do some door prizes now. So get your tickets out if you've got tickets from when you came in. All right. Where are these from, Don? It's a lovely gift bag from Mimi's Perfect Presents. <laughs> and it has a $20 gift certificate inside. All right. I don't have a ticket in here, so I'm going to draw. All right, ticket number 618-498. 498. There you go, right in the back. I hope he's married. He can find someone for okay. that, I bet. All right. All right. What's the next one we got? Another great gift bag from Mimi's Perfect Presents. <laughs> All right. Ticket number 618 519. 519. All right. All right. I'm not sure what this is, but it looks kind of sexy. Where's it from? Oh, Mimi's perfect presence. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, John. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're good. You're good. That's We're going to get you signed up for Chapman's Club. You're good. All right. 618 537. 537. All right. They're in the back. Jamie, Jamie Gilbert. All right. Thank you so much, folks, for coming out today to hear Senator Isaacson speak. We appreciate your support of the chamber. Hope you have a great day. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you.